Ross Rifles, published by Dundas West Games in 2020 by Daniel Kwan, Patrick Keenan, Daniel Groh, and Will Parks, is an RPG powered by the apocalypse about Canadians who served in World War I. I'm by no means an authority in the scene, but I've read a decent amount of PBTA games at this point, and I kind of figured Ross Rifles would fall into the same vein as Monster of the Week or Apocalypse Keys, a slate of general moves available to everyone with more specific player tools in each archetype's playbook. And while Rifles does meet that criteria, as I scrolled through the PDF, 10, 20, 30 pages in, I realized I had yet to read a single mechanical rule. In fact, pages 24 through 29 are dedicated solely to diagrams, specifications, and historical context for the game's namesake, a bolt-action rifle designed by Scottish inventor Sir Charles Ross. This game isn't that long, barely over 150 pages. Why then, would you spend the first 20% of your text on words that don't tell the reader what dice rolls mean, or what resources are at their disposal? I mean, what is anyone supposed to do with all that fluff? Wiki.rpg.net defines fluff as the parts of an RPG book other than the rules, such as setting details, game fiction, history, etc. Basically the opposite of crunch, which is all the minutia of how you're supposed to play a certain game. Emily Kerr Boss, in her essay Skin Deep, does a great job of breaking down why fluff tends to get a bad reputation in games. It's filler text, stuff that doesn't actually tell you what or how to do something. If you're being ungenerous, it's to pat out a word count, make your book seem more substantial than it actually is. But Care Boss addresses this criticism by emphasizing the utility of fluff to outline the parameters of the play space. With each word, the participants in a role-playing game shape and mold a world that never existed before. What you say has meaning and effect independent of whether or not mechanics are involved. I think this view of fluff blends perfectly into J Dragon's A Dozen Fragments on Playground Theory. I think basically everyone who cares about RPGs should read it. Its opening vignette bounces around in the back of my head like the DVD screensaver. In this opening, Dragon describes a game designer struggling with a concept, who seeks out the wise teacher for guidance. In response to the narrator's anxieties, the teacher asks who the greatest game designer of all time is. When the narrator suggests the Baker family or Yoko Ono, the teacher interjects. You have forgotten Aaron Hunter. I googled something real quick. The author of the Warrior Cats books? But those aren't games, those are just... books. The wise teacher pointed out to the park at a group of school children pretending to be cats in the grass. Behold, Aaron Hunter's game. I think it's pretty clear what Dragon is saying here, but for the sake of fluffing up my own text, let's break it down. The Warriors franchise is a series of novels in which clans of sentient cats play politics and fight brutal wars, as far as I can tell. But Aaron Hunter isn't telling hordes of fourth grade readers what dice to roll or what playbook moves to take when they level up. Instead, the norms, characterization, and tone of the series are what informs kids when they don their fursonas out in the playground. If you're reading Warriors as an RPG, it's all fluff text. And somehow, that doesn't prevent its players from fully inhabiting a role within that world. Let's extrapolate this framework back to Ross Rifles. What kind of game are we being prepped to play when we're presented with a diagram of a gun? Well, we know it's a pull-action rifle. Shots are going to come slowly compared to modern firearms. You can't just hold down the trigger and unleash a hail of lead. You're going to need to be methodically drawing back the mechanism to load each round into the chamber. That suggests a precision weapon, one better suited for marksmen shooting at range than grunts storming a fortified trench. But if that's true, then why is there a bayonet here at the end? And that's where the fluff comes in. Quan et al. discussed the history of the development of the Ross rifle in detail. Britain wouldn't send its Canadian soldiers their Lee Enfields, so Charles Ross manufactured his own line of weapons to fill the market demand. As we extrapolated from the diagram, it was, in fact, a marksman's rifle, eventually fitted with a scope and becoming incredibly popular with hunters and snipers. However, it was still given to frontline soldiers anyway, and it developed a reputation for being unreliable. So yeah, the bayonet in the drawing is accurate, but it didn't make much sense in real life either. Combined with the dirt and mud of the trenches, what were fine precision firearms were soon rendered inert. It became commonplace for Canadian soldiers to drop their Rosses once their better equipped British allies bought the farm, trading accuracy for dependability. By 1916, we're told, the Ross rifle was withdrawn from service altogether. And these details in turn pose a fascinating question about author intent. 
why would you name your game after a gun that, frankly, wasn't that great? Well, consider the rest of the fluff text. The introduction discusses the oft-overlooked contributions of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, the fact that, as a British colony, Canadian soldiers were under-equipped, but comprised a fierce fighting corps nevertheless. Canada suffered some 230,000 casualties in the Great War, over 60,000 of which were KIAs, and once the fighting was over, struggled to repay a $2 billion loan. When horrendous modern weapons were first unleashed at Ypres, it was colonial infantry whose lungs burned with chlorine. War is always an awful experience, but World War I brought industrial horror on a scale previously unimaginable to the battlefield. Ross Rifle seeks to bring the reality of that carnage to the player, contextualized through the lens of Canadian soldiers who bore the additional burden of being an empire's afterthought. They named the game after an unreliable gun on purpose, but if you skip through all the fluff text, you'd miss out on what tone the game is trying to impart. Similarly, if you have all that background information, it makes sense when you look at the character sheets and learn that you have two separate resources that, if depleted, remove your character from play. Hit points are a pretty common way of representing the well-being of your character. If they're full, you're in great shape, and if they're empty, you're dead in the dirt. So what is Rifles telling us by saying, hey, there's actually more than one way to lose a character in this game? Stress is as deadly as taking harm, and actually, stress damage has more of a mechanical impact on your character than harm reduction, since your stats drop as shell shock builds. In a game where you play a heroic warrior, you might only need one measure of how much punishment your paladin can stomach. But Rifles, even before the diagram of the gun, presents you with pages of text about the appalling conditions of trench warfare, the stench and rot soldiers on the front lines just had to endure. It makes sense for a game interrogating how mechanized warfare can ruin your brain to tell players, a month of psychological trauma can kill you just as easily as a bullet to the head. Obviously mechanics are an integral part of game design, but what I'm trying to do with this essay is describe why, in RPGs, flavor text should not be considered ancillary to hard rules. They often go hand in hand, narrative shaping mechanics and vice versa. In another excerpt from Playground Theory, Dragon describes a game's text as a dead giant and the garden growing up through its ribs as the game itself. The process of game design is simply constructing skeletons for dreams. I know it's a bit of a harsh juxtaposition, schoolyard musings against a grim account of World War I, but I think it all fits together in a way that enhances my understanding of RPGs. All aspects of a game are just skeletons for what play could be. And when Ross Rifles shows you the barrel of a gun, recounts the unpleasant history behind its development, this too is just another marker with which to draw the borders of your playground and lend weight to the stories you tell within it. Uh, thank you everybody for watching. I really appreciate everyone who takes the time to say you what I'm saying about tabletop games. Uh, if you like my work at all this year, please consider leaving a tip at my Ko-Fi, because uh, I'm saving up to get a new microphone. Um, if you want to find more of my work, I'm at AAVoit on Blue Sky, Monster Factory fanfic on Tumblr, but my main site is aavoit.com, where I talk about games, writing, and health policy sometimes. Uh, I also do two podcasts. The first is Mortified the Friendship Quest, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis. And I do another show, uh, The Bible Boys, where me and my ex-evangelical friends Michael and Josh talk about Christian media. Um, thank you, as always, for watching. Uh, this is probably my last video for the year. I thought uh, 2023 was a pretty good year for the channel. Thanks to everybody who's who subscribed. And um, uh, I'm excited to see what new games I'll, I'll end up reading in 2024. Uh, so until next year, see ya.